Uh, so what I'd like to do is, as quickly as I can, there's quite a lot of material to cover. And, and in the workshops themselves, uh, in essence, we were combining, giving participants, members of the CIHT, an insight into some of the issues around uncertainty and future plausibility, and then going on to questions of how we approach the policy-making process, and then very much trying to get their views and their discussion around those issues to try and get, to take a temperature, a barometer reading, if you like, of what the profession itself is thinking. So first of all, a quick look in the rearview mirror, and it's just a, a quick look. Um, I would suggest that um, in what I call the regime of automobility, the way of the world that we've all grown up in and existed all our lives, whether or not we own a car, um, there have been two uh, written or unwritten laws of transportation. The first one is that car traffic keeps on growing. We know that because when you look in the rearview mirror, it's always kept on growing, so why wouldn't it continue? And the second one, again, looking in the rearview mirror, is you can't have economic growth without traffic growth. The two um, are at least correlated, but appear to be uh, coupled. Uh, the question is, are we going to remain in the regime of automobility when we look forward, as opposed to in the rearview mirror? And this brings us to the challenge of change and uncertainty, and ultimately regime transition. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar uh, with the phenomenon which, which has been given the shorthand label peak car. Um, so here's DFT data uh, from National Road Traffic to Travel, to Travel Survey um, on uh, total billion total vehicle kilometres travelled by car, uh, cars and taxis. Uh, and as you know, since about 2004, uh, it's flatlined. Uh, and indeed, at the level of the individual, the per capita uh, number of trips and indeed distance travel have both gone down. Uh, a 10% reduction in trips over about the last decade. Uh, not something that the rearview mirror is used to seeing uh, and is now causing some consternation, not just in the UK, but a number of countries around the world, including New Zealand, which suggests there's something of a global phenomenon going on here. Um, which leads us into the question of where are we heading, uh, and the best consensus we can get from at least the transport experts in the UK when we have a round table in London is, we don't know, that's what we're all agreed on. Uh, it could resume growth, and indeed early data for the last two years has given some reassurance to those who wish to see the rearview mirror as the way forward. It could be reaching saturation or it could go into decline. We could be going into not just a brave new world uh, post-Brexit, a brave new world in terms of the way we connect in society. Uh, and I don't know if you've come across the notion of regime transition, but the idea of uh, regime thinking is that we, we, do, we live in a regime, a way of the world as we know it. Um, and you could characterise it as the automobility regime, as I've said. But history teaches us that uh, we do go through regime transitions from one regime to another, from horse-drawn transport to motorised transport, from cell-based shipping to steam-based shipping. But that process, and it is a process, not an event, can take several decades. And the real challenge is not knowing in, if you're in the midst of a regime transition or not. It will only be the passage of time in the history books that will tell us whether here and now in 2016 we were living through a fundamental societal transition. Um, but I'm going to venture to suggest that we might be two or three decades into something fundamentally changed about society and transport and of course even on the technological front but also a behavioural front in terms of the way we own or don't own and share vehicles and the way those vehicles are controlled and propelled and so on are giving us early clues. The future's already here, it's just unevenly distributed. Uh, and the challenge is trying to bet on which of the uh, insights that exist already might be the true signals of where we're heading. And indeed, um, you may have seen this from my colleague Phil Goodwin. He produced a nice uh, mashup of national official traffic forecasts, and colleagues in New Zealand have done the same. And in fact, there's no, a web link on your slides to a, a collection of these from around the world now, all looking rather similar, in, in which the, the rear view mirror model. I'm um, being a little bit brutal about the model here, a bit unfair perhaps. The rear view model is saying it's going to go up because we make the right assumptions based on historic data and the observed data is saying that it isn't, or at least it hasn't been for the last 10 years, uh, which is presenting or underlining the question of uncertainty. Now, uncertainty allows you to accommodate the fact that, yes, it might be business as usual uh, in three, four, five years' time, but it might not, and you have to account for that. The work in New Zealand uh, exploring is culminated in scenario planning. I recommend, of course I would, that you go through a process like it because it is about engaging in the way we are today. Uh, it's not about an academic or an expert coming along and saying, we, I've been scratching my head and I've come up with this idea. It's about working as a collective 
to explore uncertainty and arrive at some way of representing and making sense of that uncertainty from which you can then challenge your processes and policy making. So the work in New Zealand uh, identified two critical uncertainties for the future. It asked the question, what will society want to do in the future? And it looked at accessibility. And it ranged from a society that will want to connect physically to a society that will want to connect virtually. Uh, and we don't know the answer. It's a critical uncertainty. It also asked, what will we be able to afford to do in the future? And we focused on the relative cost of energy for that, uh, ranging from, of course, very high to very low. Uh, the month after we published the work from New Zealand, the uh, world oil price having been going up according to the uh, Scottish referendum uh, data, went in entirely the opposite direction, which kind of indicated really the, the choice of uh, this critical uncertainty. Once you have this pair of axes in the scenario planning exercise, you can then effectively paint a picture in each of the quadrants um, of what that future might be if the uncertainties play out in a particular way. Uh, and in New Zealand, we develop these four scenarios um, with their respective labels. Um, but my boss in New Zealand said, well, of course, we now need some numbers, otherwise no one will listen to these fluffy stories about the future. Uh, so an uh, econometric spreadsheet model was developed to do a, a, a simplistic read across to get some estimate on total <coughs> car travel in New Zealand. Uh, out to 2042 compared to 2014. Um, and you can see the figures there that are produced for these four scenarios, ranging from a world where there's a strong preference for physical connectivity and uh, energy prices alone, which we call Traveller's Paradise, 35% growth in total traffic, accommodating population growth as well, by the way. Um, meanwhile, if relative price of energy is very high and there's a stronger and stronger preference for digital connectivity in society, a 53% reduction in total travel. Um, that's vehicle miles, uh, d distance travelled by car, so it doesn't necessarily mean person miles travelled and the way in which people behave. The work in New Zealand uh, concluded, and you can find all this information online, of course, um, it sort of boiled down to three fundamental points amongst a lot of other insight. Uh, the first is that it's access, not mobility, that's key to a thriving society, whether that's um, social well-being or, or economic prosperity, it's connectivity that really underlines that. It happens to be that historically we've relied very heavily on physical mobility to achieve that connectivity, but we're now in a world where we have what we refer to as a triple access system. We've got the transport system providing physical mobility, we've got the land use system providing spatial proximity and of course agglomeration benefits in an increasingly urbanised society, and now we've got a much more mature uh, telecommunication system uh, providing digital connectivity. So this is really the, the, the system we should be looking at uh, for a prosperous UK society. Uh, and there's a need for resilient or flexible provision of access that can provide the very adaptability that we need because we don't understand what human beings will want to do in the future or what they'll be able to afford to do. Uh, it's, it's, it's a fool's paradise to try and forecast. What we have to do is try and uh, provide some accommodation for the uncertainty. Uh, and that turns to the notion that um, as we focus uh, on how the transport system is evolving, uh, it's not about being tempted to predict and then provide. It's, of course, very crudely now, and I don't think we're in a world anymore that's that simple, but predict and then provide for a future. It's about saying what type of connectivity provision do we feel is appropriate um, that we will then allow human behaviour to shape around in the future and to provide that resilience across this triple access system. Having done the work in New Zealand, uh, the lead colleague of mine that was working with me on it, uh, we, we worked together to develop a, a bit further, making sense of all of this in terms of well, what might this mean for the way we approach policy making. We've got, um, um, but we set out, and of course, remember, I'm a biased human being, uh, and I've got, I've been framing all of this, so you're already being led in a particular direction. Um, but we came up with two, in simple terms, two different policy making pathways. Um, the first one we called the regime compliant pathway. Uh, and this is a, a pathway where, in terms of preconceptions of the actors involved in the process, then it's a focus on predicted outlooks or presumed outlooks. I presume that the future is going to be driverless cars, for instance. Or practical outlooks. Uh, we jolly well need more transport because we need a, a prosperous economy. Um, it's founded upon one of the laws of transportation, the transport economy coupling. Uh, allied to weak planning, in other words, we essentially extrapolate from where we've been. Uh, it tends to conceal uncertainty, 
Uh, we're in the business of justifying the decisions we make, and particularly as an example, we use cost-benefit analysis, which provides sort of one-shot uh, projection, uh, and in very simple terms, we sort of arrive at and culminate in predict and provide. An alternative pathway we call the regime testing pathway, so the regime, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and the sorts of preconceptions of actors that might exist there are a, a willingness to consider plausible outlooks um, sorts of for, for futures, for instance, that I've briefly introduced, or indeed preferred outlooks, which are value-laden. You are actually consciously saying, I want the future to look like this. That's founded upon this wider notion of a triple access system. It's a coupling between access in the economy, not as narrowly as transport in the economy. It leads you into a territory of strong planning, where you're emphasising a better future and you're going to entertain being an agent of change. Um, that process exposes rather than conceals uncertainty, and you end up moving towards making guided decisions rather than justified decisions. And one of the tools you can use, which is sort of a comparator to cost-benefit analysis, is real options analysis. But effectively, a bit like the, the financial markets, it creates a way of you having an option to exercise in future, given the uncertainty you face. Um, and that can be applied to infrastructure, not just financial markets, hence the term real options analysis. And you culminate in decide and provide, where you're proactive in policy making, trying to guard against policy failure uh, through creating adaptability to this unanticipated change. That's a very quick counter through getting us actually to the start, if you like, of the, the CIHT journey, other than we were sharing this type of material with people in the workshops. Uh, so what did we do with CIHT Futures? Uh, well, over a period of five months or so, uh, different parts of the country, uh, 11 workshops covering 12, 12 regions of the institution, uh, and just, uh, we just nudged over 200 uh, members being engaged with that process. Um, we were sailing close to political uh, winds of political incorrectness uh, in that we divided people out by age. Uh, so we had pups who were under 35, dolphins who were 35 to 50, and owls who were over 50. A uh, bit of tongue in cheek, but there was a serious intent behind that, which was to say life experience unavoidably must be one of the factors that shapes how we, each of us look forward to, the, to an unknown future. Uh, and so by having um, cohorts, if you like, uh, at the tables in each of the workshops. There's lots of interactions between them, but it meant there was a little sense of being able to discuss amongst a group of owls what their views were reflecting on their shared life experience, and then compare and contrast that with, for example, the pups. Now, the first thing we did was, um, and I'm going to ask you to do this just before the break, uh, so start your start thinking process, uh, we said, look, what, what do you think about this idea of uncertainty and the plausibility of divergent, very different futures? Take those four scenarios from New Zealand, and we gave people eight plausibility credits. Um, and said, so place your eight credits on the four scenarios. Now, if you, if you have a mind to think, yep, I can see all four of those are equally plausible, two, 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 and two. Uh, if you think this side over here is really silly nonsense and sci-fi stuff about a highly digital world, then put four and four over here, and, and whatever combination they chose. And the numbers you've got here, um, and I don't wish this to imply this is you know, rigorously statistical analysis of quantitative data, that wasn't the purpose of the workshops, but it's a finger-in-the-air indication. We took all 200 people from across the workshops, and these are the percentages of those plausibility credits that were assigned to each of the four scenarios. So the first message, I think, is that there's some reasonable distribution across all four. So taking the collective profession, um, there's a message of uncertainty being uh, confirmed or acknowledged about the future and indeed the plausibility around very different directions we could take. Um, to the extent we should interpret it too far, um, more of a leaning towards a high energy future than a low energy future, and interestingly, a stronger leaning towards virtual uh, connectivity than physical connectivity. Uh, what I think is particularly uh, poignant uh, is here we've got the most, and again, this is not the way to represent it, but the most popular, most plausible scenario. Not the worlds that people want to see emerge, but they think are plausible and credible. The most plausible was global locals, where there was going to be a 53% reduction. So the transport profession, the experts, have said, that on balance, this is more plausible than the least plausible, um, which was saying a 35% increase in total traffic. At that point, I'll just remind you, 
of the most recent, no, not picking on DFT here, but uh, if you like, the, the orthodox approach, the official position, uh, national road traffic forecasts, and there you can see 34% growth uh, in um, vehicle miles travelled, uh, pretty much analogous to the traveller's paradise scenario. Uh, and even though, in fairness to DFT, this is, I think, one of the most open-minded, if I can put it that way, approaches to road traffic forecasts that I've seen, really trying to take on board the issue of uncertainty and the peak car phenomenon. Nevertheless, once you bring in population growth, everything's pointing upwards. In other words, the regime appears to be continuing. So now, and I apologise again for the, the pace of taking you through this, but what did we learn um, from those who came to the workshops? First of all, in terms of this issue of uncertainty, uh, well, I've covered the first two points there, so a collective voice of rather deep uncertainty about the future. And it is important, once you move into recognising that we're dealing with deep uncertainty, that's very different to dealing with what the academics call level one uncertainty, which is you know, like incremental change that you can comfortably use the rearview mirror uh, to guide you through. Um, the overall professional opinion is at odds with the official forecast. Now, one has to make the distinction between transport professionals and experts in modelling and forecasting, so not all 200 people we had gathered um, were necessarily experts in the way our road traffic forecasts are developed. It was important within the workshops, because we've exposed these, these biases at work, um, that it worked very well to have the different age groups having a clear voice, uh, and you got some interaction and compensation in a sense between uh, the different groupings, not to suggest that it was all very homogenised within age groups. Certainly a recognition that once we start thinking about this world beyond just transport as a means of connectivity to digital connectivity, that the transport sector alone isn't really that well equipped to grasp the extent of social technological transformation that's going on in the world uh, once you reach beyond the transport system as a much more of a technical challenge. Interesting observation, I suppose, is that, not surprisingly, it's transport infrastructure's use um, that's the big unknown because the, the, the capacity side doesn't develop, as you've illustrated, that rapidly over time. Um, but an interesting point that generally when you provide the capacity, it gets soaked up and used, uh, which reinforces, in fact, the idea that we are shaping the future um, whether we like to say so or not uh, from a political standpoint, and therefore the demand will follow the type of capacity we provide. And then we come into um, quite a high amount, you might see as a very sort of negative set of workshops. The, the, the tone wasn't negative, but a lot of frustration coming out from the profession. Um, and I'll start here, and I thought I had to have a formula just to look as though I had some se remaining semblance of being an engineer once upon a time. Um, and I've called it the professional comfort formula. And I think this is pretty true across um, the, the workshops we ran. So CPSDF is how comfortable you feel about the plausibility of significantly different futures. And CPFDJ is how comfortable you are in the processes that you follow in the day job. Uh, and in essence, one is inversely proportional to the other. Uh, so whilst in the, the comfort of the workshop setting transport professionals were able to say, yeah, actually, you know, I completely buy into this very uncertain future and these highly divergent possible pathways. And that makes me feel really uncomfortable about going back to the processes I follow in the day job. And perhaps, particularly in this austere time we've been going through, where people are having to hand handle turn and go through the, the basics. So frustration that we've got successive political administrations creating uncertainty for transport policy itself and its implementation. And that follows through into uncertainty for the transport profession itself. We don't have coherent strategy. Couple that with depleted local government capability, uh, that's really limiting our ability to steer the transport sector. We're being buffeted by these disruptive forces beyond the traditional the boundary you might put around the traditional transport industry. Uh, other people now seem to be in the driving seat of our profession. Um, so it's, it's unclear, perhaps, what the transport profession now means. Um, and I don't think it understates it, or rather overstates it, to say there was a sense of professional impotence coming across in these workshops. You know, these are 
um, highly skilled individuals, but skilled in a particular system of operation that, they, that we've been operating for decades, uh, fine-tuning it and adjusting it, but a way of doing things. Um, and in that context, feeling on the back foot, lacking a national transport strategy, and indeed realising that increasingly, perhaps, we lack the skills to understand what the future has in store for us, um, because things are being imposed upon the transport system from other quarters. Carrying on uh, with the concerns, um, election in Perry, I mean, this is not new to you, of course, but it's just underlying this is where the voice of the profession uh, is playing back to us. Election imperatives, fashionable ideas, and reactive funding. You know, so again, I'm not picking on DFT, but DFT says, here's a pot, here's the rules, and the money's available now, what do you want to do with it? As opposed to, well, as a local authority, uh, we understand our difficulties, and if we had a budget and we could use it flexibly, we would like to work through uh, the best approach uh, to dealing with it. So making it difficult to have a long-term planning approach and a strategy that actually delivers outcomes. Um, this is back to bias, I suppose, but the transport sector understandably is subject to vested interest, risk aversion, uh, and a rearview mi mirror mentality, which is creating inertia. And I think this sums it up most effectively, and it was mentioned several times uh, across the workshops. Uh, if all you've got is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, and again, you've probably come across the quote. Um, but here we are as a transport profession. If you're an expert in cost-benefit analysis, cost-benefit analysis, that's what I'm going to do uh, to try and understand the situation we face. Why would I possibly take out scenario planning? Because first of all, I haven't got a scenario planning thing in my toolkit, and I don't really know how to use it, but I've got cost-benefit analysis, and I can hit those nails on the head. Um, strategic planning and development is at the mercy of mechanisms employed and the motivations at play to arrive at decisions. So, you know, I'm sure several of you have either been on the client side or the uh, contractor side, where there's a certain sense that we know where all this is leading, and we're going through the motions of how to get there, um, a sense of perhaps doing it by rope, the, the tail's wagging the dog. You've got the transport profession that should be shaping or guiding politicians and decision makers in how to shape the future, but instead it's something of a lapdog um, mixing the metaphors here, uh, in following through uh, due process to allow the decisions to be taken forward. And concern as well, and this is perhaps particularly comes back to the professional institutions, that we're very good at taking uh, early career professionals up to chartered status. Um, but what happens to them after that? We're in, we're in a world now where we desperately need the next generations of leaders of our different professions. But how are we shaping those leaders within individual organisations and as a collective profession. Uh, and there was a sense that that's something that's absent. You're rather left to your own devices once you've become charter. Then we came to the question of, and again I'm going to ask you, it's going to be very brief before the break, to look at the two pathways. Um, I accept there's a bias in that, even the fact that I put one on the left and one on the right. You know, you'll read across and you think, oh, there's obviously a sense of direction here. But... We presented this to the workshops and asked them to say, which pathway do you think we're on at the moment? Or for each of those elements that are in the diagram, is it left or is it right at the moment? Uh, and then, given the world that you now understand or have been discussing that we face, which pathway should we be on? Um, always assuming it's practicable to be on that pathway, because part of the exercise in this workshop and the recommendations, I think, is not to be pie in the sky ivory tower academics spouting about the way the world should be, but trying to get some pragmatic uh, outcomes. Very strong call across all the workshops to say we need to change from our current approach, which is absolutely regime compliant. There are some elements which aren't so regime compliant. There are some particular schemes, particular levels of policy, perhaps particular transport authorities where things are different. But in the main, we are definitely a regime compliant um, system. And indeed, regime compliance suits the politicians who need to project this air of confidence about the investment decisions. And indeed, further still, people like numbers. The power of numbers comes back again. Um, of course, it's not surprising because we're familiar with the tried and tested approach, with the hammer and the nail. Um, and our existing skill sets, uh, even at leadership level, are reinforcing uh, or constraining um, ways that we might do things differently. 
I think this is a really difficult one, poignant point, which is that transport professionals are saying they don't necessarily believe in the approaches that they're following in their day job, um, but they're compelled to follow them nevertheless, because if you're going along to a public inquiry or a, a, a planning inquiry and you say, oh, I heard that lion's talking about, so what we did as a team, we went off and did some scenario planning, we ditched all the, the usual stuff, and look, it could go this way or that way. Well, of course, you're, you'll have embarrassed your company, you'll lose business, uh, you may have damaged your own reputation and taken a big risk. So what do people do? They suffer the professional or social dilemma of all staying in line, even though if you ask them individually, uh, in a safe environment, they're quite frustrated by that position. One participant made a remark which I think resonated with what we were hearing across the workshops, which is, um, well, it paraphrases, but we're accountable to the dogma and procedures of regime compliance instead of responsible for the stewardship of the future through regime testing. Uh, you know, we're very, very good at doing things by rote, and this is how you do this part of the process. Uh, and we train people to do that in our master's courses to some extent, uh, and they go into the profession and become expert at it. Um, in terms of pragmatism and fitness for purpose, what people were saying is, well, where should we be? Um, it wasn't, you might think they were all going to say, absolutely to the other side, regime testing. They all liked um, the ideology of regime testing, um, but in practice they said what we need is to be moving in that direction and taking something of the best of both, because we're not going to throw the baby out of the bathwater. There's, there's a lot of value in the regime compliance approach, but it can't exist by itself. We do need leadership of change, of course, because of this social dilemma. Um, this is partly why I was hoping to get the likes of yourselves together, because there are some key emergent organisations and devolved uh, authority in the transport sector where, and I'm not to exclude others, but of course, Re recast as Highways England and the National Infrastructure Commission uh, and the devolved transport authorities give us an opportunity if we're willing to seize it and if we've got enough impetus around this world of uncertainty to put some of this change into practice. And uh, lastly, uh, the issue of engagement came through. It might be a surprise to you, but I think it's worth reminding ourselves that um, at different levels. So first of all, participants in the workshop felt we were all just there as transport professionals. What we really need to have um, are the IET members um, or the civil engineers or the marketing professionals coming together because this is a multidisciplinary challenge. Um, it's not just one we can solve by ourselves. Um, but also, of course, uh, it was a small subset of a very big uh, professional uh, sector that we were consulting with. And many people were there for missing that entirely. So we need to be more engaged, particularly with the IT profession, but with other professions besides. And then we came across to the, the challenge of wider stakeholder consultation, particularly public consultation, and of course the distinction between that and true public's engagement, public's plural. Uh, I, I resisted finding the image of um, a classic public consultation with the demographic, which you know for yourselves. Um, it's distinctly not reflecting the, the different cross-section of society. Uh, and so an important message coming out was we really need to engage the public, not just because that's um, going to give us more robust insight uh, and indeed engage other stakeholders, uh, including younger professionals, uh, earlier career professionals who perhaps aren't even a voice often beyond doing this stuff by road. Uh, so <coughs> important source of creative ideas. So, sorry for a rather high-paced run through what's been happening, but I hope it's given you enough of a flavour.